Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for a webinar titled Unionization and the Future of COVID Recovery. My name is Paul Barragan Monke. I'm the Director of Mobilization at the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. We're a multi-issue public policy think tank that focuses on addressing the most critical domestic policy issues facing Latinos and communities of color through research, advocacy, mobilization, and leadership development. LPPI is co-hosting today's webinar along with the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, whose president you'll be hearing from during the panel. We're joined today by an exciting group of national labor and political leaders who will be discussing unionization and the important role that labor unions will play in building the resilience of our country's multi-ethnic workforce and supporting our recovery efforts in the aftermath of COVID-19. UCLA LPPI recently published a report showing that even in the face of economic devastation and a deadly virus that disproportionately impacted communities of color, unions provided an essential safety net that shielded many workers, and in particular, Latino workers, from more severe bouts of economic instability during the pandemic. The study found that unionized Latino workers were seven times less likely to experience job loss than their non-unionized counterparts. Because our economic recovery, rel recovery relies on how well the nation's multiracial workforce can bounce back from these setbacks experienced during the pandemic, this study makes a strong case for expanding access to unionization and highlights the need to pass federal legislation like the PRO Act that would make it easier for workers to access stable employment, livable wages, and advocate for safer working conditions. Today's event will begin with a brief moderated discussion with uh, some elected leaders who are championing workers' rights legislation from Sacramento to Washington, D.C. They will then be joined by a full panel of labor and civil rights leaders who are spearheading organizing efforts on the ground. And we will close out with a question and answer period where all of you as attendees can submit questions via the Q&A chat function available in your webinar dashboard. To get us started, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the afternoon, Jung Park. Jung is the California Economic Mobility Reporter for the Sacramento Bee. He joined the Sacramento Bee Capital Bureau in 2020 as part of the paper's community-funded equity lab. He covers economic inequality, focusing on how the state's policies affect working people. And before joining the Bee, Jung worked as a reporter covering cities for Orange County Register. So please join me in giving a warm digital welcome to our moderator for the evening, uh, Jung Park. Jung? Hi, good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming to this event. Um, I know we are running a little late, so we'll get started right away by introducing a couple of our elected officials who are on the panel. So first, um, Congressman Mark DeSonier um, represents California's 11th Congressional District, which covers almost all of Contra Costa County in the Bay Area. He is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions, has been advocating for policies such as guaranteeing a livable wage, affordable and accessible education, and ensuring that the government is accountable, accountable to the public. So welcome. And then I would also like to welcome Senator Maria Elena Durazo, who serves in the California State Senate and representing the District 24 in Los Angeles. From 2006 to 2014, she was the first woman secretary treasurer of the LA County Federation of Labor, AFL-CIO, the second largest labor council in the country, and served on the National AFL-CIO Executive Council. So welcome to both of you, and uh, I'd like to just get started right away with our first question. So what are some of the greatest obstacles preventing more American workers from exercising their right to organize and form unions. And I'll, you know, either of you, either of you can go first. Oh, well, thank you, Senator. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, Maria, it's wonderful to see you bring back fond memories of my old job. Uh, so, and uh, go UC, I guess a fair thing to say so for somebody who represents an area around University of California, Berkeley. Um, there are so many challenges. Uh, one of the things just transitioning from being a member of the California legislature uh, and coming from local government here in the Bay Area to um, the Congress is realizing how different are urban areas, particularly in California, and because of Maria and her, her, 
our partners, both in the legislature, but in the labor movement. Um, the California labor movement is strong, vibrant. Um, it could be stronger, but it's mostly because of the state, um, the culture we have here um, in providing for countervailing institutions. As John Kenneth Galbraith advised John Kennedy a long time ago that if you don't have political uh, as well as policy um, counterweights between capital and wages, then you get this inequality that we're stuck in that Pickerty has written so well about the history of this and the inevitability of conflict. So um, we have to keep doing what we know works, is get more people to be able to organize, uh, to represent their individual workers and group workers, um, to have the same political influence at the bargaining table, to get to the bargaining table. And that's why I'm a, a proud co-sponsor of the PRO Act. And PRO Act basically tries to uh, will, if we can get the get a consensus in both houses, um, to protect nationally much of what we do in California, New York, and Massachusetts, and other progressive states. So uh, it's important, very important, because um, when, coal, when capital is so concentrated as it is right now, and it's become more concentrated because of COVID, because of uh, the Trump air uh, tax cuts that we're trying to change right now as we speak uh, in the Congress, um, even with good regional and progressive policies, um, employment can be mobile. So um, they get around it by going to cheaper areas, whether it's nationally or internationally. So um, I'm just I'm pleased to be here, and I'll stop there because I'm anxious to hear the rest of your panel. panel. Well, uh, thank you. It's good to see the congressmen and, and all of you here. Um, I think that there are some really some, some examples of specifics which I know the PRO Act is trying to address on the federal level, and uh, we've seen them on the ground. Um, having been a union organizer most of my life uh, and head of a, a local union and the labor uh, council, I see things today that were not the tactics, the same tactics used by business and employers two decades ago. Um, some of the more newest versions of depriving workers of a real uh, opportunity to unionize, of taking advantage of what is supposed to be the law of the land, which is you have a right to collective bargaining, uh, are some things that started a couple of decades ago, but have now been adopted in uh, in many business models. And that is, for example, the um, abuse of misclassification. The abuse of misclassification allows entire industries to be kept out of union organizing. Uh, and it's done in a very deliberate way. Uh, uh, and we know the most recent example of that is our uh, Uber drivers. Uh, and how um, Uber and similar companies spent over $200 million in a state, uh, on a state ballot measure so that their companies would not be subject to basic labor laws, basic labor laws, laws that have been in effect for as long as 100 years. Those, though, by classifying them as employees, they would be left out. So this ballot measure was meant to carve out um, and, and allow Uber and others like them to um, uh, misclassify, uh, legally misclassify uh, their employees. So that's a very insidious kind of use of what independent contractors were supposed to be about. Uh, another version of misclassification are the port truckers thousands and thousands of port truckers who are misclassified as independent contractors so that they don't have the right to be able to organize into a union. Um, so, and, and I think there's the, the tech industry in, in all its new models, business models, has a very specific way in which workers are impacted. Uh, and they're either doing it very deliberately or they don't care about the consequences. That's to say um, the, the best for them. They don't care about the consequences. There's a, a potential industry strike 
uh, in the Hollywood uh, industry with the IATSE unions. Why? Because of this new system of uh, producing content that again, uh, the workers will have to pay the consequences of not having uh, the right contributions made to their health and welfare and, and other consequences. So there are very specific concrete ways in which sectors, entire sectors of our economy are being deprived of the right to unionize. That's on top of, on top of what have been the traditional ways of depriving workers to organize. So we're up against uh, uh, an enormous, uh, you know, very powerful interest and uh, appreciate the Congressman in terms of uh, pushing forward on this PRO Act. Uh, we need something that matches the kind of power on the other side. And I have a lot of questions uh, to ask, but let me, um, first of all, start with Congressman uh, Desanier. Um, can you explain to us a little bit about the PRO Act? And going off of that, um, it seems unlikely that the PRO Act as a whole will pass the Senate, given the filibuster and other factors. But there has been a lot of push to include at least some of the provisions in the PRO Act in this reconciliation package that is going through Congress right now. Um, can you walk us through what kind of provisions that we could see in that package that could make it easier for workers to unionize? Uh, you're on mute, Congressman. Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. I think you're muted now. Okay. Just when I got used to WebEx and Zoom, I've got to get used to another. Um, so I, I am technologically impaired generationally and mentally, so apologize. Um, well, it, it's, it's frustrating. First of all, there shouldn't be a filibuster. Uh, we should get rid of the filibuster. It's part of the systemic racism, in my view. Uh, that is still in this country. Um, you know, California has has two U.S. senators, and they represent 40 million people. Wyoming has two U.S. senators, and it represents 650,000 people. And if you look at the history of why Wyoming's a state, it was a trade-off between regional interests in the South and the North. Um, not a good trade-off. So you know, if we really are a, a culture that's supposed to live up to um, equal opportunity, we should be honest about our inheritance and get rid of the damn thing, in my view. Um, so that's negotiation now is in this very big, important bill, three and a half trillion dollars, at least for me and Senator Sanders and uh, so many of the rest of us in the Progressive Caucus, we started out at six trillion. It's not too much. It's too little when you look at it expended over 10 years, not one year, as it gets portrayed. And then when you look back at the last 50 years, the lack of investment in human infrastructure. So sorry to go off on that. Um, the specifics should be, I think, balanced against what, what the other side is doing. The capital, um, I view very unethical side that, as the senator said, tries every, they have more resources. Uh, so we have to spend more and more money um, into enforcement. So they, they test everywhere. So some of this is trying to figure out um, as we compromise to get as most as we can get done, um, and the senator alluded to this, too many capital investors, it's a risk assessment about what they can get rid of. And there's not a lot of moral authority to that group of people. That's not all employers, but a lot of them. So we're trying to be strategic as to the issue of contract workers that we've had to fight. Um, and I, I must say, a lot of these folks are people who are heavily invested in tech companies in our area, in the area I represent, California. So um, I'm sorry not to be more specific, but part of this is a non-negotiation, try to figure out what the other side's doing and what we can get in the bill at the same time, get it passed and signed into law. But it's more, a lot of this is about um, matching them in their strategic efforts with a lot of resources that continue to undermine the spirit of law, both in terms of classification 
but I would say an underestimated part is enforcement. I have an amendment that would make sure that the, the fines when you break labor laws would go up um, and the funding would be not directed to the treasury, but redirected into the labor department. One of our problems is we don't have enough enforcement for the existing laws. Um, so they have to know that they're gonna be held accountable. And that, the, that their very um, dry cost assessment, that they know that there's a real financial penalty, not just a fine that they write off. Got it, got it. I know we are at 118 and uh, we should bring the rest of the panel in very soon. Um, I do have one question that I really wanted to ask Senator Durasa, so I'm going to ask that and then introduce the whole panel. Um, we are coming at the end of the session when it comes to the legislature. Um, Governor Newsom uh, vetoed a bill which would have helped organize and unionize. Um, what do you make of this veto and, and what's your plan in terms of helping those farm workers uh, get better ability to unionize going forward? Uh, well, uh, I, like uh, many other legislators, are very disappointed um, that this bill was not signed. It merely said, let's exercise our right the way, in the same way that we have a right to vote. In California, everybody can vote by mail. And this was about voting by mail in a, talk about the most secretive, secretive way that you can do it. Um, so we're gonna keep on uh, insisting, we're gonna keep on uh, moving forward with this because uh, what we need is more democracy in the workplace, not less. When we saw that out in the political world of voting and elections, when we saw all the tactics that were used, deliberate or not, unintentional or intentional, didn't matter. If the end result were that less people were voting, we had to do something about it. And so we did. And slowly we have made more and more voting by mail as one way of increasing the vote. Uh, make it easier, not harder. Um, and we treasure that. There are states uh, in the South that are doing everything possible to make it harder and harder. And that's the opposite of what democracy is all about. We should apply that same principle in the workplace. You know, no, we would never stand for, uh, in California, somebody standing outside a voting booth and threatening you that you're gonna lose your job or threatening that you're gonna get suspended or, I mean, a, a myriad of ways. We would never stand for that. Why would we then turn around and say, it's okay, in the workplace. We hold the workplace up as a place, I mean, across the world, uh, if a country does not respect the right to unionize, they're immediately put on the list of dictatorial regimes. Uh, so we have to, as a nation, we have to care about democracy in the workplace. That's what the Farm Worker Bill was about and very simple and we're going to keep on uh, pushing until we get that through. Well, thank you so much, Congressman Desaunier and Senator Durazo. Um, we will introduce, introduce the rest of the panel, uh, but you're welcome to obviously stay on longer and answer some of our questions um, throughout. Um, so we will um, get on with um, the rest of the panelists. Um, first of all, um, I think we have Dr. Patricia Campos Medina, who is the executive director of the Worker Institute at Cornell University. Um, the Worker Institute advances collective bargaining and education on contemporary labor issues to generate innovative thinking and solutions to problems related to work, the economy, and society. So welcome. Um, and we also have Secretary Treasurer Janela Hines, um, she is at the New York City Central Labor Council, AFL-CIO. She joined the staff of the United Federation of Teachers in 2006 and was elected vice president of academic high schools in 2012. She is a member of the American Federation of Teachers, Black and Latino Caucuses. So welcome, Secretary Treasurer. Um, and finally, we have President Yanina Marino, who was elected as the first woman and first formerly undocumented immigrant to lead LCLAA, which has advocated for unionization as a way to secure rights and job protections. 
She has worked in numerous organizing campaigns, immigration efforts, as well as Solidarity Workers Central America. And I just see her popped up. So hello, welcome to the panel. Um, and yes, one well, welcome to all three and, and all five of you um, now here. Um, so we will get started with the first question. So um, as practitioners and labor leaders who are leading organizing efforts on the ground, what do you believe are some of the greatest barriers preventing workers of color from accessing union jobs or unionized professions in general? And how can we eradicate some of those barriers? Um, and I would struggle with kind of figuring out how to uh, you know, figure out who we talk first. So any of you who want to chime in first, just go ahead. Um, let, let, let me start and let me say first, thank you, uh, not only for this one, but for the study that you put forward showing the numbers, facts, what, why it's important and what union does for workers. And my say hello to my sisters here. They are champions of working uh, families uh, for years and uh, mentors and friends in many ways in this a small world of us in the labor movement, but with big ideas and trying to actually move big agendas. So, hey, look, in reality, uh, it's, it's, it's many things. It, you can go from, yes, being afraid. Some, no, but it's not the biggest thing. And a lot of people talk about workers being afraid, but I go always back. The biggest organizing drive have happened among women, people of color, immigrant workers. You know, it's in New York, or it's in LA, and it's in Chicago, it has happened, we have seen it. So fear is not the factor. It's a lot of communication, I would say, it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of efforts to actually communicate the right message uh, and, and, and figure out strategically how do that message will come. And how do we strategically, once again, uh, concentrate or choose um, campaigns that will be directly to minorities? Uh, from my part, I was an organizer for many years, so I think that that's that's one. So it's it's a lot of disinformation. I would say there is a lot of disinformation from workers. I, I would talk from workers that are immigrant workers to workers that we uh, have been born here. Like for example, we pay too much dues. No, dues are only for people who lives in Washington D.C. Information like that. They really get to uh, workers, uh, yeah, and we have to work very hard in order to erase those. To uh, being able to have the correct messengers to deliver those messages. No, when it comes to that, I mean, really have not only workers and workers of color, women doing and bringing these messages to, to, to the workers that we're trying to organize. Those are a few things that I believe can be a way how, how it has prevented. Uh, how do we overcome that is by doing exactly the contrary that I described, you know, finding those people that like to do it. Here you have, I know Patricia and I know Seno Durazo for many years and they have been, as I say, champions. And we have more people. So bringing those messages is important. Uh, having a conversation with employers, not all employers are bad. <laughs> Not all employers are bad, and having that conversation re and realistically, and employers see us having that conversation. I think the many don't see, we're talking about the many that are not unionized, they don't see that relationship that ex actually exists between employers and unions. It's very healthy, and we're able to move agendas. And there is not a lot of, because there is an, a lot of news about that, So, which is important. So I will go to the, uh, the media. Have you ever said anything when workers win being it's not out there and so i think that is important because that brings not only yes there is ability to do it but also hope that's a very interesting point um and anybody else want to chime in um i can i can go on uh next thing it's a pleasure to be here with all of you with uh janita thank you for all that you do and Maria Elena, uh, you know, you're always being a role model for all of us. And Janela is right here on the East Coast, my 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 psychic fighting uh, the good fight in uh, in uh, in the New York New York region. So a pleasure to be here. And Congressman, uh, nice to meet you in person. I know your name, but uh, uh, nice to be part of this panel with all of you. So um, I am the executive director of the Worker Institute at, at the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University. 
Um, before being an academic, I had a long career in the labor movement, uh, you know, from uh, with Unite Here. My, you know, we were colleagues with Maria Elena for a while with LACLA um, when uh, Janita was a board member um, of, of LACLA. It's a pleasure to see her now leading LACLA. Um, but now that we, I am wearing this same academic, um, academic role in which we do research uh, on, on workers and uh, how do we support workers in their, um, in their struggles to gain collective bargaining power or collective economic power, right? Because um, it, we, we, we believe fundamentally that workers, any worker from the professional to low wage to immigrant workers, the way they build power is by coming together and joining a union. Uh, unfortunately, in many of the industries that our Latino community uh, are prevalent on in the service industry, um, in the low wage industry, and even on some on the, um, the healthcare industry at the, at the entry level of the healthcare industry, they do not have uh, the ability of full time jobs uh, that grant them, uh, you know, um, uh, rights immediately to, uh, to a full time benefits or, uh, or access to a union or if they are in the precarious workforce, as Senator Maria Elena Durazo spoke about, they basically lack protection from the formal law of the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act. And that is um, structurally something that we're gonna have to deal with as, as, as leaders um, in, the, in the movement, thing outside the movement and economic justice movement. How do we expand the definition of who has access to collective bargaining rights uh, whether it be expanding the NLRA or creating other systems of collective bargaining power. But even within a, a current um, system of collective bargaining rights under the NLRA, National Labor Relations Act, we still have a lot of uh, folks in, uh, uh, in, a, in the low wage industries from the restaurants to, uh, to the uh, uh, transportation, the logistics, distributions, who are who have been demanding for a long time the right to join unions. And I think that it's, it's sort of like a give and take. It's a, there is a lot of misconception about what unions are, but there's also has been a hesitancy from some of our more, um, some unions uh, to figure out how to proactively organize those workforces. So sort of like we have to attack it from both ways, right? What do workers need to know about unions and what do unions need to understand about the workers that are now working in this industry. They're more diverse. They're more, um, they're a lot of women. Um, they are, they are, they need a little bit under the, the issues that they're facing perhaps are not the same that they used to be uh, facing before. And we have a high number of, of immigrant workers because I know Janita works on this every day in which the threat of, of getting fired is an issue. It's a real issue. Um, so those are some of the things that we sort of have to contain with. But now, what we have seen um, during the, you know, the pandemic had, um, made these workers, the workers in the low wage service industry that is and not unionized, uh, reveal how these workers who were perhaps ignored before, how they became essential to our survival. So immigrant workers, service workers, low wage workers, app workers became essential during the pandemic. And, and there's more of an understanding from the public that we need to organize, that they need a sort, certain rights. So in a recent study that we conducted at Cornell University uh, together with the National Employment Law Center, um, which is called the Just Recovery Report, we found out uh, that what we all knew as an activist, that about 60, 65% of Black, Latino, and women workers are more likely to join a union if right now the unions go and try to organize. And there's a lot of barriers to actually get them a union, but there is a, a high urgency to organize this workforce. So that this is where a strengthening NLRA um, through the PRO Act is essential, you not know, to uh, to uh, uh, take away some of the power that corporations have to delay elections, to deny the right to join a union and to intimidate through a threat of deportation or through a threat of firing. So I think that we are right to, uh, to give that power to workers. In the non, uh, in the non uh, 
for example, in the app workers, right? The app workers or the gig workers in the, in the economy, there's a lot of activity from uh, the, so, the social justice um, community in trying to figure out what is the right balance of power, what are the rights that these workers ought to have so they can able to bargain with the tech, high tech companies. Because in a study that we did in New York City with app workers that deliver for Gruber and Uber apps, they actually, when they accept a job in the app, they agree to the rules of the game and there's no negotiations. And yet they are at the mercy of an employer that they don't know who it is. So this is where we need public action and public policy from elected leaders to create a, play, a level playing field in, in determining who is the employer who tells this worker who's delivering food how much ultimately he's gonna earn. And so at that level, we need public policy input and, we, and there's a lot of folks out there trying to figure out how to do that. So I'll stop there, but I think it's a very exciting time for organizing a low wage workers, Latino workers, and the unions are better positioned to deliver power through the union card to workers. And if I could jump in here, um, it is my great honor to serve on this panel with my sisters, Yanira and Patricia, Senator DeRazo, a pleasure to see you um, laying the foundation as a secretary treasurer on the other coast and Congressman DeSonier, lovely to meet you as well. I just wanted to add a small piece to what Patricia was talking about with regard to the obligation of labor unions to connect with working people. Um, it's important for workers to see people who look like them, who speak like them, who have similar experiences to them. And the way that we do that is we expand the ways in which our unions, our locals um, consider what representation and collective bargaining can look like. Our working conditions are critical, right? We need to make sure that we are paying people a living wage and we need to make sure that their working conditions are fair and are just. We also recognize that there is an intersection between the working conditions and between what everyone is experiencing right now. So how are we advocating for people to get the healthcare that we need? How are we advocating for our workers to remain safe um, when they're dealing with issues of, this month is Domestic Violence Prevention Month, right? So are we bringing that into the workplace as well? As, and, and myriad issues that we think about as working people because we don't turn off our humanity once we go into the workplace. And I think one of the ways in which our unions can expand our power is by taking advantage of these opportunities to see the full humanity of working people wherever they are working. Got it. Thank you so much, all of you, for chiming in and letting us know of your thoughts. And um, I, I, I want to ask you, Secretary Treasurer, um, about when it comes to diversity of the labor movement, um, AFL-CIO has repeatedly called for diversity in the labor movement and its leaders. Um, I'm, I'm curious to get a sense of whether you think the union, as well as other major unions, have made progress in diversifying its leadership, because that is, as you said, one of the more important aspects of trying to get more workers of color to join a union. Absolutely. The progress has been made. And um, in the last couple of years, that progress has been astronomical. We finally have a woman who is the president of the National AFL-CIO. It is unfortunate that Liz Schuler became the president under conditions that she did. Um, and certainly um, her predecessor, President Trumka, um, was committed to doing this work as well. But now we have a, a talented, um, outspoken, passionate woman who is serving in a position of leadership and is leading with a, an incredibly diverse um, leadership of the AFL-CIO. That is um, establishing a foundation and, and a model for what labor unions could look like across the country. There are talented people who are um, representing all groups, whether we are talking about racial groups, ethnic groups, gender, age for sure, um, disability, LGBTQ status. There are so many different ways that we can think about how we bring ourselves to leadership. And, and I think that our, the labor movement 
is taking steps to expand the table so that there are many more voices being heard. Got it. Um, oh, go ahead. Just real quick, I think the issue of diversity needs to be thought of on many different levels. Uh, of course, there's the national leadership, and we're so proud of um, our sister, Liz Schuler. But I also think that there is a great importance, Congressman, why we need to pass the PRO Act, which is the more organizing that we do on the ground, the more diverse the rest of the ranks of the labor movement can yes. and should be. Uh, in my local union, having come out of the hospitality uh, industry, uh, we were able to train and pull up rank and file members, dishwashers and housekeepers and cooks, because we did active organizing. And as we did active organizing, then that training uh, you know, grew, the leadership grew, and then we were challenged with all these openings for organizers who eventually became officers of the union. That happened, moved to the national level. We now have uh, across the board the national level. So I, I really think that it's not just a map. It's, it's not like we just pluck people out of where they're at somewhere somehow magically. There's a lot of work and investment that goes on the ground. I think Sister Yanira would not be where she's at today had that there not been active organizing on the ground where she came out as a, an active uh, union rank and file organizer to be where she's at today, if that organizing on the ground. So I really think that um, um, the power of diversity is best, is at its best when we do the ground up organizing and when we're successful in doing yeah. that. Okay, can I jump there? And thank you, I, I totally agree with what Janela has said and uh, Senator um, Durazo has, has said. Uh, the other aspect adding to that is, you know, in the union world, we have all these apprenticeship programs and we have to be more open with them. We actually have to open, have improved access for minorities, for people of color and women. And I mean, it's a lot of work. It's an, it amplifying what Maria Elena was saying, you know, Senator Durazo was saying here, I improve access and retention and where we already exist, where we have the structures that we already exist. And because I come from construction, for example, and retention is an issue. It is a clear issue when it comes to minorities and specifically women. So we have to talk about that uh, ensuring equity and safety and the job is important. I know in the case of women have have the opportunity to provide a system when we can control sexual harassment that happens in the job. It's, it's very much important because these are very uh, issues that are important to us as workers. And if we don't have that base, the opportunity for us to grow into leadership is diminished if we're not actually expanding on those levels. So I thought that that was also important adding to what my other two sister mentioned. Got it, got it. Um, I will just like to remind our audience that we are just a few minutes away from the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit your questions on the chat and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, I wanted to expand on um, what the president said, but but before I do that, though, um, Dr. Campus Medina, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the subject of gig workers. Um, I read a recent story that said nearly a quarter of the workforce is gig workers. I for me to hear. So it, 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 it's now a fact that they make up a big proportion of our workforce. Um, and I have covered um, Prop 22 and the subject of gig workers extensively um, last year and this year. And one of the arguments that we hear a lot from the companies such as DoorDash, Uber and Lyft is that their workforce is largely people of color who quote unquote want flexibility in their work. You probably heard that quite a lot, right? What, what do you make of that argument? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think that that is a cop-out answer by corporations that uh, 
that want to use the idea of flexibility as an excuse not to provide people for full-time opportunities. I think that there is a small percentage of that workforce who does want to have that option. But but if you look where, where our economy is at, most workers in all of the tech app, the app companies, the tech companies, basically, that's the entrance, and that, those are the jobs that they're being created. So they actually have to have two, three gig jobs, four gig jobs to have a full-time salary or to be able to cover their expenses. So if those are the only op jobs we're creating, is there really an option for workers to have to, to have uh, to have a full-time job? No, there is not. And there's many, for example, in the gig economy, in the app economy, just during the pandemic, what we saw is that while restaurants closed, while people stayed home, while people didn't, have, uh, people got uh, ordering online, uh, the workers who were laid off, many times the only option that they had was to deliver work, to, de to deliver food, or to go uh, take a, a, a extra chef at the at delivery center. I mean, is that an option, or is that the only choice you have to make in order to survive? So I think we just have to flip that argument. Uh, what we need to be demanding for is more responsibility from corporate America to actually create full-time good-paying jobs, or at least decent good-paying jobs. Because even the, by the time uh, gig workers are done pay, uh, taking all the liability of the job, their uh, their wages are below minimum wage. And this is saying um, not everybody pays. Uh, dollars an hour as the minimum wage that's in just a handful of states so we need to change that uh that rhetoric now the big demand that workers have right now whether it are be workers or workers in the healthcare economy and even in schools that janela knows very well is that they want to feel safe at work they want to have access to health care because if they get sick they want to be have the ability to go to the doctor they also want more basically and they also want family to pay family leave and those are things that you know we have we're having a debate right now uh, uh, in congress about whether those are investments that are citizens we should make i would say that if we don't make those investments our economy will never pick up at the pace that it should pick up because women you know this a majority a lot of women are not returning to work because it's more expensive to pay for child care uh, than, than to stay home and not work so right now those are very difficult choices that workers are making so i will say we have a responsibility as advocates and to demand that policy makers create create more policies that that rewards well, that encourages or demands corporations to create good paying jobs but also to encourage uh, small businesses to also do it. I mean, I, I, Janine is right. Not all, all employers are bad. <laughs> Some employers want to do the right thing. But if they are, if if we don't force the big guys, the big corporations, to do the right thing, then the big, the little guys who are just a moment part companies cannot compete with that, and they will be thrown out of business. So it's it's, it's the both. It's the car and the state. But um, you know, but we have to start saying worker. If you give worker a choice to have three big jobs or one full-time job with benefits, uh, the majority will tell you that they would rather have one job uh, than have to put together a living for three, four, five jobs. Got it. Got it. And um, thank you so much again for um, chiming in. And um, I think I see Hector on the chat. Um, yes, we are open city open for Q and A. So if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat, and we will um, try to get to as many as we can. Um, so while we wait, um, I think we can just um, ask this question that I was thinking about, um, and this is for all of you. Um, as we see the uh, predominantly white generation of baby boomers begin to retire from the workforce in large numbers. And as the rate of workers of color entering the labor force continues to rise each year, what role can unions play in facilitating the transition between these changing demographics? And how can unions help welcome an increasingly diverse workforce? Before anyone chimes in, um, I know we are still trying to get some questions and I would like to get those um, 
And so if you can keep the answers relatively short so we can get to those questions, that'd be great. But anyone can chime in. I, I would just start by saying we, we need to let people know that um, organizing is part of the pathway to equal opportunity. And I love Peter Strag's work um, on the West Coast about how similar it is today to the European wave of immigration and the need for workforce and how they raise their wages. Having grown up in Lowell, Massachusetts, listening to my grandmothers talk about working for the one of the first labor unions in the country, which was the women's textile workers. Um, it, it, Peter's work is really interesting because we're seeing that this West Coast um, sort of similar history repeating itself, but I don't think the general public realizes that and how vibrant that is for raising, I hate this expression, bad Kennedy quote, raising all boats. It's just, to me, it's progressive trickle down, doesn't work, but um, that opportunity for people and diversity is not a threat, it's actually a strength. And I, I would just say here on the West Coast that we, Maria, we have really good um, experience with that between South Asians, Asians, Hispanic, Latinos. Um, I am told that our building trades in California is now 80% minority and women. That's a story that needs to be told and everybody benefits from it. Got it. Um, we have questions from the chat, but I think um, Yamiya, you want to you want to speak, so go ahead. And you're on mute, I think. I think it's important that I mean it's important for union to welcome workers, uh, all workers, of course. I mean, but workers of colors because of what uh, the congressman just mentioned. Uh, but because it is, I mean. When we when we unite not only the ability of workers to have a voice in their workplace, but also through unions uh, into organizing even more unions enrich themselves not only in the work side but also in the political life of this country. Uh, Maria Elena, I think at the beginning said in order to have a full democracy, we have to have a strong voice, a workers' voice, and that's a reality. We cannot continue going having a small sector. I, and we proud of what we have organized until now in the change, but we have a lot to do, and we have a lot of sectors where we have to do more organizing. Once again, I think uh, being more flexible, more open in the ways that you can join a union uh, in different apprenticeship programs, I think is important. We have to revise that, not only for um, being more diverse, but in order to attract. Um, some years ago, probably about 10 years ago, or less than that, at the University of Chicago did study with us many day laborers if they will join a union. 95% of them answer in the spot, yes, we'll join a union tomorrow. The problem is that we feel we're not welcome. The problem is that we need to have documents. The problem is that we have to speak English. There were so many reasons that they gave that, of course, among this group, we know that we were very hard in order to overcome them. So we need to work even harder that spread the message, as Congressman was saying, but also, uh, as I say, reflecting. that Because that, that's another aspect. I mean, if I'm talking here, this group is very diverse. But we also need to reflect that at different levels in, in the unions, I, I think, is, 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 is a challenge for us. But also understanding um, that things have changed. Now union can not only talk about bread and butter issues. We need to talk a bit broader about all the issues that are affecting our communities. And I think that is important. That's key. Well, let me bring one. We cannot continue to talk about organizing all workers if we don't talk about immigration reform because that's a reality. That's an obstacle in the eyes of many workers to actually join a union. Might not be in reality on the books, but it is how many immigrant workers see it. And, in a, in a, and today, when we have so mixed families uh, and household, this a mixed household, that a message needs to get through. So that is important for us to spend some time in looking. And at, as I said, both for the union, but also for the community and building um, building connections with community organizations that actually help us bring that, this, this type of messages. Got it, got it. So um, we have questions on the chat that I'd love to ask. So um, I think uh, we see here, um, can you please speak to any policy solutions that prevent employer retaliation for speaking up about unsafe workplace conditions? Um, I don't know who would be the best to answer that, but if anybody has some thoughts, please um, 
yeah, chime in. I would just say very quickly that um, that has been an element that we have worked hard to negotiate in our individual contracts. So um, here in New York City at the United Federation of Teachers, we do have anti-harassment language in our collective bargaining agreement that covers our public schools. There is also language that um, protects whistleblowers. Um, that that isn't something that we were able to negotiate years ago when our contracts were first being negotiated. We have had to move over time to get to that language. But, um, and, and it does take time to, sh to shift people's thinking about whether or not that is a right that they can take advantage of. But we are proud that um, within our space, we do have anti-harassment and anti-retaliation um, language that we have been able to negotiate in our contract. And I would just, just like to say that uh, in case of health and safety, uh, safety protection, the best protection is having a union in the workplace because you have a, usually you have a health and safety committee and you have a way to, uh, to address those issues. So number one, that that's where workers see the difference of having a union or not. But uh, at the basic level, right, um, under OSHA, uh, there are protections, on the federal OSHA, there are protections for, uh, for your refusal to do unsafe work. The, the problem is how do you get federal OSHA to come and protect you in case you think a, a, a job is unsafe and you refuse to do it? Uh, the power is on the employer, right, at that moment. So, um, but just wanted to clarify that at the federal level, there is, uh, there, there is that protection. And different states enforce it differently, like I'm sure California and, and per, perhaps um, Maria Elena can speak more to this. There are other levels of protection as to uh, when a uh, of, 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 of way to uh, file complaints of if, a, if an employer refuses to honor the federal law. But, uh, but fundamentally, the best way to protect your health and safety is having a union to negotiate a process of grievance. And, uh, but unfortunately, we don't have that many uh, contracts. So uh, maybe Maria Elena can talk specifically about how California protects health and safety um, at the state level. Well, um, there's no substitute for unionization. There just isn't. Employers know industry by industry. Uh, they know that there are limited resources of government. Um, and they have business models that are very, very much dependent on a lack of collective bargaining, uh, a lack of unionization for them to go to the extremes. Um, we just passed, for example, the first in the, in the country on our Garment Workers uh, Protection Act. And um, here's a business model that relies on wage theft. Imagine that. It's not a bad player here and there. They rely, the entire industry. So there's 45,000 workers here in that industry. And the, uh, the studies that have been done, the surveys that have been done show an extraordinary number of them having these wage and hour violations. So um, we know we will never have, no, we're gonna have these protections. I'm counting on the Garment Workers Organizing Center to be the, the, as close to a union as possible because they will organize these workers. They'll have backup for them, we'll have legal services. And we include legal, uh, legal services in the bill, but we really, we cannot do everything that we can. Uh, the, the port uh, truckers, um, they, the union uh, organizing them, the Teamsters has put up millions and millions of dollars over the years. Um, you, you can't substitute if they were unionized. We, that would never have to happen. Government wouldn't have to step in um, and, and do the protection. So uh, businesses know that, industries know that, and uh, to the degree there's unionization, there's a higher level of, of uh, health and safety, higher wages and everything else. And we don't need, you know, uh, policing by the government because the workers police their contract. Um, you see the difference in construction, you see the difference in hotels, you, you name it, no matter what. 
that's always the case. Uh, okay, we have one more minute, um, and we have one more question. But uh, if President Marino, if you can just chime in real quick. Um. Yeah, and thank you. I just wanted to say that we have to be proactive and enforce with the laws that already exist. No, mm -hmm. I mean, in the very basic, as uh, 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 Patricia said it, in the very basic, and nothing is like union censorship, in the very basic, let's take OSHA, for example. And I know the Biden administration is trying and working very hard to change that. There used to be a lot more inspectors. Now, now mm -hmm. it's under, uh, under 600, I believe. I mean, mm -hmm. that alone is, is an issue. Uh, it's not only that then you have to encourage workers to have the courage to report something and having to waive uh, the, the, what the employers are going to do to them. But now they call to an agency that don't have anybody to send yeah. and over, I mean, oversee that. So it's also we have to continue advocating that that happens at the end in the very basic levels. Got it. Got it. Um, well, thank you so much for all of you for um for chiming in and letting us know of your perspective and insight. Um, special thanks to Congressman Desanier and Senator DeRosso for sticking around the whole hour. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, and um, I think, uh, Paul, uh, back to you, I think, if you want. Thanks, Jiang. Uh, let, let's all please give another virtual round of applause for our moderator and our incredible panelists. <laughs> Uh, so thank you all so much for joining today. We hope that you're able to walk away from this event with some new frameworks and strategies in how to support the rights of workers in your respective communities. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about LPPI's research projects or to participate in other national policy discussions and events like these, please uh, visit our website at latino.ucla.edu or follow us on Twitter using the handle at, Latino, at UCLA Latino. Uh, thank you all again for uh, sharing this space with us, and we hope that you each have a restful uh, rest of your evenings. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Hasta luego. Bye. Adios. Adios.